Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. Claudia Prieto, in a broad coat over a dress bought last Tuesday, decisively opened the doors of the Magnolia restaurant and entered. Following her were her closest relatives, Aunt Dahlia, Uncle Simeon, their daughter Milu, and her husband Silvio. Good evening. Did you reserve a table? A slim, beautiful girl who immediately approached Claudia Prieto, radiantly smiling, and took a look at her companions. You know, Natalia, the woman read the girl's name on her badge, my son is having a wedding here, and I, with my relatives, intend to participate in this celebration. We don't have a wedding banquet reservation today, Natalia the administrator objected. Perhaps, you got the wrong restaurant? You may have got something wrong, but I came to the right place. Claudia Prieto unceremoniously brushed the girl aside and headed deeper into the hall, followed by her relatives. You can't go there. Security. The administrator looked around helplessly. Only six in the evening and there was already an unusual situation. And this was on her second day of work. Claudia Prieto managed to pass by almost all the tables on the right, some of which were free, and turned left when a security guard, a young and strong guy in a neat suit, gently took her by the arm. Let me go. The woman screamed. Demetrio. Son. A young man at the farthest table on the left by the window immediately turned around. He quickly stood up, whispering something to the girl sitting with her back to the hall, and approached Claudia Prieto, who had managed to free herself from the security guard's hands. Everything's fine. This is my mom, the guy nodded to Claudia Prieto's companions, and my close relatives. Demetrio, my boy. How could you do this? The mother pleaded, her eyes welling up with tears once the security guard had left. This is not right. It's like you're an orphan. How to celebrate a wedding without a mother, without relatives? Mom. Dimtrio resignedly waved his hand and called the administrator. Natalia, could you please arrange a table for seven? Dimitrio, all the tables are booked for tonight and both private rooms are occupied. But we can join your table with the neighboring ones. Would that work? Yes, that will work. And the wedding menu for seven people, please. Understood. Demetrio left the hall and then came back quite quickly. All this time Claudia and her relatives were standing near a small stage where the musicians were tuning their instruments. I told you that we would be at this wedding anyway, Claudia Prieto declared in an indignant whisper. Claudia, this is a bit awkward, Aunt Dahlia tried to argue. Well, no. It will be my way. Claudia fell silent when she saw her son coming towards them. They're setting up our table right now, Demetrio, who had approached them, announced. We didn't plan a ceremony. So all this is a surprise to us. Indeed, we understood, the mother pursed her lips. You were hoping to manage without us. But what can you do? That's just the kind of mother you've been blessed with. As long as I'm still strong, you'll have to put up with me. The waiters quickly joined two tables, set up utensils, and snacks. One of them nodded to Demetrio, and he invited the relatives to follow him. What a daughter-in-law I got, Claudia Prieto whispered to Aunt Dahlia on the way. Who is she that she doesn't want to see her mother-in-law on her wedding day? She didn't even get up to greet us. The group of relatives approached the table where a girl in a delicate pink dress with a high collar was sitting. Golden long curls lay on her shoulders and framed her face, which was stared at by five pairs of astonished eyes. Multiple scars disfigured her face to such an extent that Claudia Prieto found it unpleasant to look at it. The sight made her speechless. The rest of the guests also averted their eyes. Meet Tina, my now legal wife, Demetrio casually introduced the girl and named all the relatives who had suddenly appeared. Tina nodded to each one. She seemed not to be embarrassed by her appearance at all. In any case, her shoulders were straight and she was sitting absolutely upright, not trying to hide her eyes, unlike the uninvited guests. A waiter approached with a bucket where champagne was chilling. Demetrio nodded to him, indicating that he could fill the glasses. Mom, you probably want to make a toast? 
Demetrio asked Claudia Prieto. Let Uncle Simeon make a toast. He is the eldest at this table, Claudia replied. To the health of the young. The elderly man proposed the toast, not very confidently, and downed the contents of his glass. The rest of the relatives followed his example. Demetrio and Tina sipped from their glasses. Son, could I have something stronger? Claudia Prieto unexpectedly interjected. As soon as a bottle of cognac was brought to the table, she promptly poured herself a shot, then another, washing it down with a sandwich of red caviar. A tense silence enveloped the table. In the restaurant, a light, pleasant melody began to play, performed by the musicians. One artist expertly improvised a solo on the saxophone, another sat at the piano, while a third, with a guitar, stood by the microphone. The guests drank again and chased it with snacks. The waiter brought more champagne. It was evident that everyone was slightly tipsy and feeling freer, but conversation at the table remained stilted. The guests, without looking at the bride, muttered some toasts, having switched to cognac. Claudia Prieto wasn't listening to them, but managed to down a few more shots. Indeed, Claudia, I never expected that your Demetrio would make such a choice, Aunt Dahlia, who was sitting next to the groom's mother, whispered softly. Claudia Prieto understood the insinuation perfectly well. She's gloating, no doubt, she thought. About a decade ago, at the wedding of Milu, Dahlia's daughter, Claudia Prieto had tactlessly blurted out that their son-in-law was not exactly handsome. She'd said it as if jokingly. But Aunt Dahlia took offense and retorted, We'll see whom your magnificent Demetrio chooses. Laughing, Claudia Prieto had replied, My daughter-in-law will be a beauty, I'm sure of it. You'll see. And could there have been any doubt? From a young age, Demetrio had girls flocking around him. Claudia Prieto's son, tall, slender, with blue eyes a living embodiment of a woman's dream. She had raised him alone since becoming a widow. His father had died when Demetrio was twelve. His mother doted on him, unable to deny him anything. Only the best for Demetrio. For years she had waited for a daughter-in-law. Finally, at the age of 30, her son had decided to marry. But to her shock, he had declared to his mother that he had decided to have a quiet wedding. And he had not even introduced her to his future wife before the wedding. What a disgrace. But now she understood why. Demetrio had left for the city immediately after graduating from school. There, he had studied at the university and subsequently started working at a restaurant. Demetrio started as a waiter while still in college, later becoming a manager. Just six months ago, he had found a position in a trendy restaurant as an assistant manager. And in the future, he would run the restaurant, or perhaps, even open his own. The mother proudly regaled both family and neighbors with tales of Demetrio's career, taking pleasure in their impressed, even envious, gasps and sighs. Yes, this was the son she had raised. Though she herself hadn't completed any degrees, she had provided an education for her son. And he, in a way, carried on the family dynasty. Claudia herself had started as a cook before becoming the head of a small cafe. And then Demetrio chose to work in a restaurant more substantial than that cafe and oh so stylish and expensive. This would have been the ideal venue for a grand wedding celebration to invite the whole clan instead of just the closest kin. Claudia Prieto had only dined there once when she visited her son during the first days of his new job. It crossed her mind then what a perfect place it would be for a wedding. But at the time, her son didn't have a fiancé. He had said as much. But ahead of the New Year's celebration, he delighted his mother with the news that he wanted to marry a wonderful girl. Oh, how her motherly heart rejoiced. He had promised to bring her home, to introduce her, but he never did. Then he stopped calling, avoided conversations, including ones about the wedding. Just a week ago, he announced that they would simply sign the marriage papers and dine at the restaurant where he worked, just the two of them. He even asked his mother not to question this decision. Demetrio promised he would explain everything later. But Claudia Prieto couldn't sit still when her son was getting married. She convinced her Aunt Dahlia to ride with her in Uncle Simeon's car. 
Milu couldn't miss such an event either. She was Claudia Prieto's cousin, nearly 20 years younger, and the same age as Demetrio. They had been close in childhood. How could she not attend the wedding? Even if no one had invited her, one can't hide from family. Maybe Milu had heard Claudia Prieto's comments about the looks of her husband, Silvio, and wanted to be among the first to see Demetrio's bride. After all, he had always been surrounded by the most beautiful girls. But how could his mother have anticipated that he would marry such a monster? The shame she felt before her relatives. Look at them, already smirking. Even Milu's unattractive husband Silvio seemed to feel handsome. He glanced at Claudia Prieto's new daughter-in-law and whispered something to his wife. Likely, they were discussing Tina's unattractiveness. And yet, her beautiful son acted as if nothing was amiss, holding his chosen one's hand and looking into her eyes. What was this madness? Had she bewitched him? Tears welled in the eyes of the insulted mother. My son, how could you choose such an ugly woman to be your wife? She sobbed when Tina excused herself from the table. The bride hadn't gone far and undoubtedly heard these words. Milla giggled, Silvio roared with laughter, Aunt Dahlia covered her mouth with her hand. But Claudia Prieto had drunk enough alcohol to allow herself to voice her pent-up feelings. I didn't expect this from you, Demetrio. It's clear now why you didn't want us to attend your wedding. She spoke quite loudly through her tears. Mother, I beg you, be quiet. Demetrio exclaimed indignantly. You don't know anything. What on earth is going on? My only son, Claudia Prieto lamented, I raised him to be smart and handsome, and he... She didn't get to finish because the music in the restaurant suddenly blared louder. It was an extraordinarily beautiful melody. Then, a magical female voice began to sing Ave Maria. The pure high notes rang out freely and effortlessly. Everyone at the table was transfixed, as if they had heard an angel descend from heaven. The voice was so wonderfully melodic. Who is singing? Claudia Prieto, momentarily forgetting her impassioned tirade, asked in astonishment and turned around, otherwise she wouldn't have seen the stage. Standing at the microphone was Tina, her so-called ugly daughter-in-law. In a free-flowing light pink dress that fell to the floor, tall, slender, and delicate, she actually looked like an angel. What a transformation! From such a distance and in this light, the scars on her face were not visible, and even if they were, it didn't matter anymore because her voice penetrated to the very depths of the heart and to the most hidden corners of the soul. Oh my God, was all Claudia Prieto could utter, her hands clutching at her chest as the music and the astounding voice subsided and the restaurant burst into loud applause. Who is she? My wife, Demetrio simply replied and went to meet Tina to help her down the stairs from the stage. He took her hand and the newlyweds exited the room. The waitstaff brought out hot appetizers, but none of the guests felt like eating. They stared at each other in silence. You shouldn't have spoken so ill of the bride, Claudia, Aunt Dahlia chided her niece. The fog of alcohol suddenly lifted from Claudia Prieto's mind, and she felt an unbearable shame. Her son had said that she didn't know anything. Probably about how those scars had appeared on Tina's face. I understand Demetrio, Uncle Simeon suddenly declared. Such a voice touches the soul. You wouldn't notice any flaws in the girl. When the son and his bride returned to the table, Claudia Prieto poured herself some mineral water, drank it down in one gulp, coughed, and said, Tina, you sing divinely. The bride lowered her gaze and smiled. Two months ago, Tina had walked into the psychologist's office. Her long, curling hair fell over her face, hiding the scars, but she knew how these scars disfigured her. The day before, she had borrowed a mirror from a girl in the neighboring room and saw herself in all her glory. Tears had streamed from her eyes. Had Demetrio seen her in such an ugly state? How had he not run away when Tina herself could not bear to look at herself? The psychologist seemed not to notice any changes in her appearance. As usual, she greeted her with a smile and offered her to sit in an armchair or on a sofa. Tina chose the armchair, climbed into it, tucking her legs underneath her. 
She knew that it was allowed in this office, and she wanted to curl up into a ball and become invisible. Only not with her above average height. Before, her height hadn't troubled her. On the contrary, everyone around her admired her model-like appearance. And her angelic face and blonde curls, as her mother used to say, made Tina a source of admiration and joy to anyone she met, regardless of age or gender. But all of that was nothing compared to the impression her voice made. When the little girl began to sing at about three years old, in kindergarten and school, she was always a participant in all concerts and vocal contests, and she had no competitors. Her future as a successful solo career singer was predicted by her music school teacher, and she planned to study in a capital university. But a tragedy in her life had thwarted all plans. On the eve of the graduation ceremony, Tina's parents were killed in a car accident. After the funeral, her aunt Licha, her mother's sister, took her to a well-known psychologist in their city for the first time. And working with him had helped Tina cope with the loss, overcome depression. That took more than half a year. The hardest period was when it was time to enter university. Aunt Licha barely managed to persuade her niece to apply to the local university of culture in the Department of Vocal Arts. After her parents' death, Tina didn't want to sing, but she had to prepare for the creative examination somehow. Tina, sing what you love the most, and Licha had advised, understanding that Tina might not sing at all and take a gap year. But studying, she hoped, might distract her, help her return to life. The aunt quickly formalized guardianship over her niece. That year, the same faculty had a lot of competition. The psychologist managed to achieve progress with Tina on the eve of the creative exam, and the girl managed to sing so beautifully that the members of the audition committee were brought to tears. It seemed as if Tina's voice had become even stronger and more beautiful. She was admitted to the university. From that day, she was always singing. It was as if she had some kind of inner need to express her feelings through song. These were songs from famous rock bands that Tina's parents loved to listen to, songs from their favorite movies, and arias from operas and operettas. She wanted to sing at the top of her voice, but she couldn't do that living in an apartment building. The psychologist advised her to find someplace where she could sing without worrying about disturbing her neighbors. This dream was put on hold until her final year of university. Tina was invited to the trendiest restaurant in town by her high school friend, Victoria, for her wedding. Musicians played the saxophone and piano there, and a young man sang songs to the guitar that didn't fit the usual restaurant repertoire. The atmosphere of the establishment was somewhat unconventional for a restaurant. Victoria, where did you find such musical accompaniment for your wedding? Tina asked the bride, a note of surprise and admiration in her voice. They're local guys. They play and sing in this restaurant, Victoria responded. Could you sing me a song as a gift, she unexpectedly requested. Tina, emboldened slightly by the champagne she had consumed, got up on stage to ask the musicians if they could accompany her. We can adjust any backing track, the guys assured her, hoping for a chance to rest and grab a bite to eat. Choose your song. The saxophonist approached the laptop. Do you have Whitney Houston, Celine Dion, Barbara Streisand repertoire? Tina clarified. Are you joking? The young man raised his eyebrows in surprise. Do you sing so well that you can handle their hits? Or has the alcohol given you courage? Both, Tina smiled. Well then, here are the notes from Whitney's finale in The Bodyguard. Thank you. Tina approached the microphone. I think I better leave, the saxophonist declared to his friends as the music started, descending from the stage. Something's about to happen. It seemed he was certain of Tina's imminent failure. But when she began to sing, he froze in his tracks. It was too good. He couldn't believe his ears when Tina effortlessly hit the highest note. He noticed that the entire restaurant had ceased eating and speaking. All the guests watched the stage, where the girl sang a well-known musical hit so beautifully that not even Whitney Houston herself could have done better. When Tina, finishing the song, dropped the microphone, the entire audience rose in applause and called out, Encore! Encore! The saxophonist swiftly climbed back onto the stage. 
That was insanely cool, he exclaimed enthusiastically. Are you going to sing anything else? The girl smiled and nodded. That evening, Tina sang at the top of her voice, her singing delighting the people. What ensued was a mini-concert that the bride later called the best wedding gift ever, when Tina, amidst thunderous applause, descended from the stage. Thank you, dear. Victoria embraced her friend. The musicians resumed their work and started playing a pleasant melody. Tina had barely taken her seat when a middle-aged man in an expensive suit approached her. I am the manager of this restaurant, Pablo Herrero, he introduced himself. I would like to offer you a job here. What kind of job? Tina asked, surprised. As a singer. At least on Fridays and Saturdays. Or any other day when you're available. We usually work until midnight. Our transport would take you home. Do you work or study somewhere? He spoke excitedly, and Tina, incredulous at her good fortune, was even more surprised when he mentioned the amount of the fee per night. I'm studying at the Institute of Culture, and I would like to sing here. At first, Aunt Litchell wasn't thrilled about her niece's employment as a singer in a restaurant. On the other hand, the extra money would certainly not go amiss for the young woman. But the very next day, Litchell herself visited Magnolia and had a conversation with Pablo Herrero. After this discussion, where she was assured that the guests usually behave properly, that there's a security guard present, and that staff transport would be provided after work, Litcha exhaled in relief. Moreover, a psychologist reassured her that this job would be beneficial for Tina. And so, Tina began singing at Magnolia twice a week, her voice giving release to unexpressed emotions. Her singing truly healed, brought joy, and emotional tranquility. Tina also appreciated the recognition of the restaurant guests. Some of them started visiting specifically on the days when she performed, just to listen to her as if at a concert. One day she saw a young man in Magnolia, engrossed in conversation with Pablo Herrero. This stranger looked like he stepped straight off the cover of a fashion magazine, a tall handsome man with blue eyes, stylishly and expensively dressed. Who is he? Tina asked Sancho, the saxophonist, with whom she had formed a friendship. The new deputy to Pablo Herrero. Do you like him? He replied with a good-natured smile. Just curious, Tina shrugged off. The deputy manager himself approached her a few minutes later after finishing his conversation with the management. Demetrio, he introduced himself, and you must be Tina? Yes, she replied, trying not to show that she was slightly embarrassed. Pablo Herrero has spoken highly of you. I am looking forward to your performance, he said with a smile. Tina looked into his blue eyes and knew she was in trouble. It was love at first sight, although she was sure that only happened in books or movies. She hardly knew this Demetrio, but something about him captivated her deeply. Not only his appearance, although it was flawless. He spoke very softly and pleasantly, emanating charm. It didn't seem like an attempt to impress, even though he undoubtedly succeeded in doing so. That evening, Tina sang for him. She kept catching his admiring gaze whenever he appeared in the room to greet especially important guests. He clearly enjoyed her singing, it was noticeable. After midnight, when the restaurant was closing, Demetrio approached her. Tina, would you mind if I drove you home tonight? He asked. The staff transportation was a microbus with a somewhat grumpy driver that would shuttle the wait staff and the shift administrator to their homes. The musicians lived within walking distance from the restaurant. All the workers resided not too far away. But Tina had to be driven to the other end of the city. Tina agreed to the new boss's offer. She was slightly nervous, unsure of how to behave, but tried to hide her anxiety. Do you have any thoughts about pursuing a solo career in the capital? You have an extraordinary talent, Demetrio asked as they drove in his sleek new car. I've just graduated from the Institute of Culture. My teacher, Pero Arias, has sent my recordings to theaters in the capital. He is convinced that my place is an opera or operetta, Tina smiled. He considers this job at the Magnolia frivolous. And what do you want? I like singing in the restaurant. I know everyone here. 
They treat me well. An opera singer's career is a tough business. I don't know much about it. In any case, I need significant support. Otherwise, as Pero Arias says, I would be chewed up and spit out right away. So, he's looking for a reliable patron among his acquaintances for me. So, you might soon leave us? I don't know when and how everything will be resolved. Are you already looking for my replacement? Rather, I would like you to stay a bit longer. I think my career question will not be resolved by the end of the summer, so I will certainly be singing for a couple of months. And by the way, now I can sing not only on weekends, but several times a week. I have rehearsals during the day, and after lunch, I'm free. My teacher is intensively preparing me, making me practice vocals every day. They pulled up to Tina's house, and Demetrio got out of the car to open the door for her. His gallantry made an impression. She extended her hand, and privately noted that she found his touch extremely pleasant. Can I pick you up in the evening? What time do you usually leave? Tina answered, said goodbye, and quickly entered the building where her Aunt Licha lived and where she had been living since her parents passed away. Her heart was about to burst with the overflow of feelings she'd never experienced before. At nearly 22 years old, Tina had yet to have serious relationships with the opposite sex. Her model appearance and stunning voice often intimidated rather than attracted young men. Additionally, she had a steadfast friend, Diego, from her first grade, who always accompanied her everywhere, his demeanor signaling to all that Tina was under reliable protection. His athletic build, broad shoulders and tall height, striking facial features and piercing gaze, all these visible qualities of Diego didn't leave a chance for anyone to approach Tina. And if anyone dared to take the risk, the loyal friend would pull them aside for a talk. Tina didn't know what he would say, but the potential suitor would promptly disappear. Diego, because of you, I'll never get married, Tina would tease, giggling. Well, I'll make sure that you end up with the bravest, most determined, and reliable guy out there, not these others. Worst comes to worst, I'll marry you myself, Diego would retort, to which Tina would always respond with a bright laugh. After high school, Diego entered a technical college. When tragedy struck Tina as her parents passed away, he supported her the best he could. After his graduation, he immediately enlisted in the army. He would write Tina a ton of messages every day, painting a vivid picture of his military life. Diego visited Magnolia before leaving town. He even met with the manager and asked him to keep an eye on Tina and the musicians while he was away. But Tina assured all her colleagues that she and Diego were strictly friends, and he was like a brother to her. Does your buddy even know he's permanently in the friend zone? Sancho, the saxophonist, would jest, chuckling. I have no idea what you're talking about. Tina would protest. We've been friends since the first grade. Diego, I think I'm falling in love. He's the best, and you'll like him. Tina wrote to her best friend that night before falling asleep. The following day marked the beginning of her romance with Demetrio. He came to pick her up with a lavish bouquet of flowers. All evening, whenever he wasn't occupied with guests, he watched her, causing her heart to skip a beat in delight. On his very first day off, he invited her on a date. From there, her relationship with Demetrio progressed at a dizzying pace. He showered Tina with flowers and gifts, met Aunt Licha, who immediately took a shine to the young man. Tina learned that Demetrio was born in a village. His mother had raised him on her own since he was a teenager, and he had built his career himself, starting as a simple waiter. His apartment, with its panoramic windows and a luxury high-rise in the city center, was both cozy and beautiful. Tina loved waking up there to the aroma of coffee, which Demetrio would brew for her. In early September, when Pero Arias informed her that she was awaited in Moscow for an audition and that she had every chance of joining the theater troupe, the news didn't thrill her as it would have before. Tina, such an opportunity is rare for graduates of our institution, her astonished professor tried to persuade his former student, hearing her polite refusal and gratitude for his efforts. Think it over. Thank you so much, but my plans have changed, Tina declared. Won't you regret it, 
asked Demetrio when she told him about the conversation with Pero Arias. Not at all. I want to be with you, she replied, and leaned into a long kiss. On New Year's Eve, Demetrio proposed to Tina, slipping a beautiful ring encrusted with diamonds in the shape of a flower onto her finger. On the 1st of January, they were planning to visit Demetrio's mother. He wanted to introduce her to his fiancée. They planned to celebrate New Year's Eve at Magnolia. All of December, Tina had been singing her favorite winter songs and had prepared a special repertoire for New Year's Eve. Demetrio had ordered her a dress styled like a snow maiden's coat. Sancho, the saxophonist, had fitted a Santa Claus costume. A big celebration was expected. On December 31st, Tina, in high spirits, was hurrying home from the beauty salon where she had had her nails and makeup done for New Year's Eve. She was smiling all the way, savoring the anticipation of what promised to be the most unforgettable New Year's night of her life. As she turned towards Aunt Litch's house, she immediately noticed the smoke pouring out of the windows of a ground floor apartment next door, and inside the window was a little child. Tina quickened her pace, then broke into a run, and within half a minute she was at the window behind which a three-year-old boy was crying loudly, coughing from the smoke. A fire had broken out in the neighboring apartment, and there was no one around to help. What was she to do? Tina called for help, but the house echoed back with silence. Somewhere in the distance, music played and firecrackers exploded, while a fire raged in an apartment where a child could perish. The apartment was always rented out, and Tina had no idea who was living there at the moment. But could this child be in the apartment alone? Tina scanned the surroundings, looking for something that she could use to reach the window to rescue the child by breaking the glass. Her eyes landed on a carved wooden ladder, propped against the trunk of a large tree, which sported a treehouse built by a local craftsman for the neighborhood children. Tina was tall enough to execute her plan. She propped the ladder against the window, picked up a stone, and began climbing up the rungs. Just hold on, little one, I'm coming to help you, she repeated as she ascended. Turn away, she commanded, and shattered the glass once the boy had turned towards the wall. She cleared the frame of shards and reached out to the child. Oh, Lord, a fire. Tina heard a woman's voice behind her. Finally, someone was there to help. Call the emergency services. Quickly, she shouted to the woman. Is there anyone else in the house? Tina asked the boy as she started descending the ladder with him. Esponjoso, the boy sobbed in reply, and through the small window, from which smoke was billowing, Tina saw a cat. He needed help too. Tina handed the child over to the approaching woman, who immediately wrapped him in the folds of her fur coat. Meanwhile, Tina moved the ladder to the window of the kitchen in the apartment. Where are your parents? The woman asked the little boy. And Tina heard him answer, they went to the store. Meanwhile, she had reached the window sill and was stretching her arms towards the small window to reach the cat. But the creature only meowed loudly and plaintively, not moving towards her. Coughing from the smoke, Tina made another attempt to reach Esponjoso, as the little boy had named the cat. Her fingers had almost grabbed the cat's paw when there was an explosion. A wave of heat washed over her, and countless small shards, sharp as stings, embedded themselves in her face and neck. Tina only had time to instinctively close her eyes tightly before she was thrown backward. When she opened her eyes, she saw the kitchen window she had just been standing near, having climbed up the ladder, now ablaze. In the distance, the sound of a siren could be heard. A crowd of people had gathered around. Someone bent over her. Don't touch her, commanded someone else. The ambulance is on its way. Tina saw the rescued boy in the woman's arms, tightly holding onto Esponjoso. The animal had had better luck than her. She lay in the snow, unable to feel her face. Later in the hospital, the pain was so unbearable that Tina was given double doses of painkillers. Window glass shards were removed from her over several hours. The injury was further complicated by the burns on her face. It's a miracle your eyes weren't affected, said the doctor, examining Tina, but your face is badly damaged. Luckily, the burns are minor. There are mostly cuts from the glass. 
I was told that there was a propane tank for picnics in the kitchen. That's what exploded. Tina rang in the new year within four drip, and in the morning, they were removing more shards. The last pieces were extracted from her face on the third day. Aunt Licha and Demetrio were allowed to visit Tina on January 1st. She had no idea what she looked like, but judging by her aunt's reaction, it wasn't good. Aunt Lichet covered her mouth with her hand and immediately broke into sobs, while Demetrio stood frozen with a strange smile on his face, repeating that everything could be fixed. Tina, they perform wonderful plastic surgery these days. I'll pay for it, don't worry. The most important thing is to get better. We will make everything perfect. Is it really that bad? The girl tried to keep her composure, but tears streamed down her face. Demetrio says the surgery will help, and Licha tried to reassure both her niece and herself. Tina had asked to be left alone and for no one to visit her for a while. A few days later, she was given permission to get out of bed and leave her room. That's when she borrowed a mirror from one of the girls. What she saw in it was something she couldn't have imagined in her worst nightmares. Her face was gone. All that remained were cuts and peeling skin. It couldn't possibly be her. Only her green eyes were left of the Tina she used to be. The girl froze and dropped the mirror. She was in deep shock. A nurse scolded the girl who had given her the mirror and ushered Tina back into her private room. Soon after, a psychologist came to visit her. She spent a long time talking with Tina and scheduled another meeting for the next day. When Tina entered the office, the psychologist looked at her as if she didn't notice any changes in her appearance. As usual, she greeted her with a smile and offered her a seat on the chair or the couch. Tina chose the chair, curling up on it, drawing her legs beneath her. She knew that it was allowed in this office, and all she wanted was to curl up and disappear. Meanwhile, Claudia Prieto was washing her hands in the ladies' room of the Magnolia restaurant. Aunt Dahlia came out of the cubicle. What a bathroom, she exclaimed, taking in the beautiful walls adorned with magnolia flowers, lights, and sculptures of slender women. Aunt Dahlia sat down on the couch while Claudia powdered her face. Claudia, you have a good daughter-in-law. One could say she's heroic. Demetrio made no mistake in choosing her. It's just an unfortunate incident that happened to her. When Tina was not at the table, Demetrio had told the relatives about his fiance getting injured in a fire while saving a little boy and his kitten. Aunt Dahlia, Demetrio told me something else. Tina is pregnant, it turns out. Oh, what a joy, the elderly woman exclaimed in surprise. That's why Demetrio married her, the newly minted mother-in-law continued. And I think it hurts him to look at her. But he's a decent guy. He won't abandon her now that she's injured and pregnant. But you don't seem happy? Aunt Dahlia ventured with doubt. What is there to be happy about? It's uncertain how all of this has affected Tina, what kind of child she will have. Maybe the child will be sick. And Demetrio plans to pay for her plastic surgery after she gives birth, which is no small amount of money. He promised to help me, but he might as well close his mortgage with that money. Claudia, what are you talking about? Demetrio loves this girl. All difficulties can be overcome with love. I don't know if he can withstand this trial. There's no doubt that Tina sings divinely. But to see her so ugly every day, can my little boy bear it? I don't know how he manages to stay so calm. Claudia Prieto began to cry. What a trial has befallen him. Claudia, would you really be happy if your son abandoned his pregnant girlfriend in such a predicament? Aunt Dahlia asked indignantly. You know, I think I would have preferred not to know, not to see this Tina. But I've raised too decent a son. Demetrio loves Tina. Otherwise, why would he have married her? Out of pity, Claudia declared confidently. And in general, it's uncertain how much plastic surgery will help her. Maybe it will only slightly alleviate the ugliness. But to live with such a terrifying woman for the rest of his life is terrible, no matter how well she sings. Claudia wiped away her tears and moved towards the door. Aunt Dahlia sighed and followed her. 
Back at the table, the bride was missing. Demetrio was merely conversing with Milu, reminiscing about their childhood years. Silvio and Uncle Simeon were devouring a meatloaf with vegetables. The women took their places. Claudia embraced her son and handed him an envelope. This is our wedding gift to you. Mom, why? You're the one who needs the money right now. The house needs repairs. I wanted to help you, but it's not possible right now. You understand, don't you? I understand, echoed the mother sadly. Where's your bride? She's my wife now, Mom, Demetrio smiled, though somewhat sadly. She went to the ladies' room. Aunt Dahlia's eyes widened. Has it been long? Claudia asked anxiously. She left just after you did. You didn't run into each other? No. Maybe she went out to get some fresh air, Demetrio suggested. She often feels nauseous morning sickness. She didn't want to have the wedding before the plastic surgery. But I insisted. I want my child to be born within wedlock. When is she due? asked Claudia. She moved closer so that their conversation would not be overheard by the others. However, Aunt Dahlia seemed to be straining to catch every word. The baby is due at the end of August. Five more months. How are you handling all of this, my boy? The mother softly inquired. I see a therapist. I look Tina in the eyes. She has very beautiful eyes. Yes, but it's not easy to see them on such a face. So many scars. Will plastic surgery help? You can't imagine, Mom, how beautiful she was, Demetrio said, tears welling up in his eyes. My poor boy, Claudia pulled her son's head to her chest. His mobile emitted a melodic sound, indicating an incoming text message. Demetrio picked up the phone. It's from Tina. While he read, Claudia scrutinized her son, trying to understand what Tina had written and where she had gone. The bride has left us. She was tired, not feeling well, and took a taxi, Demetrio informed her, perplexed. She left her own wedding? Just like that? Claudia Prieto was outraged. Demetrio, can we stay here a little longer? Of course, Mom. And you won't leave us alone? No, I'll stay with you. Tina went to Aunt's place. She wrote that she'll spend the night there. She wants me to spend time with you. I'll book hotel rooms for you. There's a good hotel nearby. What about your apartment? It would probably be cramped for everyone. Son, we're simple people. Milu and Silvio can go to the hotel. Aunt Dahlia, Uncle Simeon, and I will stay with you, if that's okay. Do you have a couple of sofas for us? Yes, all right. I'll accommodate you at my place, Demetrio replied distractedly while typing a reply to his wife. The guests seemed to come alive after the bride's departure. Claudia asked for some cognac, and the waiter brought another bottle, changed the plates, and added more appetizers. The music here is a bit mournful, the groom's mother noted. I would dance if they played something more cheerful. Can we request that, my boy? Claudia, let's forego the dancing, Aunt Dahlia interjected. Demetrio, would you please order me a coffee? And will there be cake? Silvio asked with hope in his voice. Yes. I'll order coffee now, Demetrio stood up, and they'll bring out the cake. Claudia, didn't you understand? Aunt Dahlia asked indignantly as the groom left the table and then the hall. Understand what? It seems that Tina heard our conversation in the ladies' room. That's why she left. I didn't say anything inappropriate, Claudia retorted. Only the truth. Well, even the truth can be hurtful, Aunt Dahlia sighed. We upset the poor girl. And look how bewildered Demetrio is. We shouldn't have come. Oh, please, Claudia Prieto scoffed. We did the right thing by coming. And Tina needs to get used to her new family. Getting married isn't like going to the movies. Demetrio asked the waiter to bring coffee and cake, then he retreated to his office. He reopened the message from Tina on his phone and read it again, my love. 
I feel very unwell, sorry. I'm going to Aunt Lich's and will spend the night there. Take care of your family, don't worry about me. Kisses. He dialed Tina's number, but a woman's voice on the line informed him that the subscriber was temporarily unavailable. Demetrio covered his face. He felt an overwhelming fatigue. More than three months had passed since that ill-fated day of the fire when Tina was horribly injured. When he first walked into her hospital room, he was horrified by the sight of her face. Is this really Tina? He thought at the time. Perhaps there had been some mistake, and this girl with the disfigured face was pretending to be his beloved. He loved to kiss her lips, nose, cheeks, and her perfect chin. Now he couldn't imagine ever being able to touch what he saw in place of Tina's face. Of course, the idea of plastic surgery came to him immediately, and he voiced it right away, more to reassure himself than the girl. But upon leaving the room, he immediately went to the doctor's office to find out if her previous appearance could be restored. Young man, we are doing everything in our power, the elderly doctor replied. First we need to heal the cuts and burns, and then we can talk about plastic surgery. Look for a clinic where they can do it well, with the best result. We have other tasks here. Besides, your girlfriend is pregnant, so in any case, it would be better to postpone the plastic surgery until after the birth of the child. Pregnant? Demetrio asked again, I didn't know. It seems she herself was unsure, but today it's been confirmed. She's about four weeks along. Demetrio felt completely shattered after New Year's Eve, which he had to work through, knowing that Tina was in trouble. They hadn't allowed him to see her yesterday. Pablo Herrero told him he could stay at the hospital that they'd managed without him at Magnolia. They had managed to find a singer for the holiday night, and everything else at the restaurant was already in place. There was nothing to worry about. But Demetrio didn't know what to do with himself and decided it would be better for him to work until morning, then head straight to Aunt Lich's, whom he had already contacted and made arrangements with, and go to the hospital with her to see Tina. Those who had booked tables for New Year's Eve at Magnolia were looking for relaxation and fun, and they didn't care about his tragedy. He simply had to do his job. When the chime struck midnight, he went to his office and downed half a glass of whiskey. That was how his New Year began. But at the time, he didn't know what he would see in the morning. Demetrio took weeping Aunt Licha home and headed to his own place, where he downed another measure of whiskey. Exhaustion took its toll, and he fell into a deep sleep. The next day, the doctor said that Tina didn't want to see anyone for the time being, and it would be better to respect her wishes, and that a psychologist would work with her once she was able to get around. Demetrio thought that he himself could also use a psychologist. One of his classmates had just earned a degree in psychology. He decided to call him. I don't know if I can accept Tina with all these changes. Life didn't prepare me for this, Demetrio said, clutching his head with his hands. I can't be with her, and I understand that leaving would be too cruel, and it wouldn't make things any easier for me. Is there anything left in that girl that your gaze could latch onto? The friend-turned-psychologist asked. Only her eyes and hair. That will be enough. Every time you look at your girlfriend, focus your attention only on her eyes and hair. We choose what we want to see. That's how our brain works. You'll learn, and over time, you'll stop noticing her changed face. Does that actually work? Demetrio questioned his friend's competence. He found it hard to believe that he could not notice what had happened to the face that was once the most beautiful in the world. Does it work for anyone? It will work for you too if you really want it. Do you want to stay with her? Or do you really want to leave? Then we'll need to talk differently, the friend psychologist suggested. No, I want to stay with her. I'll try, Demetrio declared decisively. He went for a few more sessions with his psychologist friend and indeed began to feel better. When he saw Tina again, he focused only on her eyes. They were the same beautiful green. Tina, too, saw a psychologist trying to accept the terrifying changes within herself. And it helped. 
The healing scars somewhat eased the sight, or perhaps, as his friend had promised, Demetrio was growing accustomed to his lover's new face. After her discharge, Demetrio tried to persuade Tina to move in with him, but she adamantly refused, returning to Aunt Litch's apartment. For now, Tina couldn't work at the restaurant, and her spot was filled by the singer who had performed on New Year's Eve. Every day, Demetrio visited Tina, bringing flowers, groceries, and her favorite dishes from the restaurant. She read a lot, rewatched her favorite movies, and had video calls with her psychologist. She never complained about her health, but Aunt Litcha discreetly told Demetrio that Tina felt nauseated almost daily. Despite Demetrio's daily visits, he and Tina had drifted apart. They only embraced when they met, and kisses or anything more intimate weren't even brought up. Their conversations revolved around events at the restaurant, the books Tina read, and the movies she watched. After a month, Demetrio suggested evening walks when he wasn't working. Tina would wrap half her face with a scarf, pull a hat down to her forehead, and they would wander the nearby parks and squares. When they found out they would have a son during an ultrasound, Demetrio proposed they make their relationship official before the baby was born. Tina didn't like the idea. I wanted a normal wedding, she said with tears in her eyes. I thought I'd be the most beautiful bride in a white dress. And now what? Let's wait until the baby is born and I have the plastic surgery. All right, let's have the wedding after the surgery, Demetrio agreed, but let's get registered now. We won't invite anyone. Just the two of us, in our restaurant, at our window table. Tina resisted for a while, but then she gave in. What was the outcome? His mother and relatives showed up uninvited. Why did he blurt out the registration date? Demetrio reproached himself. He perfectly understood the anguish that the sidelong glances at her face from strangers caused Tina. No amount of therapy could help with that. But Tina stayed strong in the hospital when she saw sympathy and pity on the faces of doctors and nurses, and now, when his own mother looked at her with surprise and disgust. It was because of Demetrio that Tina had to suffer today. Now she had gone home alone, and he was left dealing with his relatives. But his mother wouldn't change. She had always been like this and always would be. Demetrio heaved a sigh, stepping out of the office into the main hall where his relatives were eagerly awaiting him. Your stage persona is intriguing, enthused the proprietor of the Star of the East restaurant, scrutinizing Tina. She was donned in a long, black, loose dress adorned with sequins and embroidery, and a high collar. A small cap speckled with paillettes sat on her head, hiding her forehead while a thick lace veil concealed the lower half of her face. Thus, her green eyes, accentuated by bright makeup that made them even more expressive, were the only features visible. Her long, wavy, blonde hair cascaded down her delicate shoulders. Why do you hide your face? I'd rather not discuss that, Tina responded. If you're satisfied with my voice and my image, I would like to get to work. I see, intrigue. That suits our establishment. Your voice is perfect. And it's impressive that you can sing not only in English, but also in Turkish and Arabic. Yes, I know several songs. Do you realize that we're open all night? We're the only nightclub in town, but we open at 6 in the evening. Are you comfortable with that schedule? Yes. That was specified in the job posting online. Well, the short, bald man rubbed his hands in satisfaction. You can start work tonight. And so, Tina exited the restaurant onto the bustling street. The previous night, she had arrived by train in this southern city by the sea. Completely shattered on the day of her wedding, when she returned to Aunt Litch's apartment, she already had a plan. She found a singer's vacancy in a restaurant online, sent a recording of several popular songs, and received an invitation almost instantly. She quickly booked a train ticket via a mobile app. She told Aunt Litcha that she was leaving to join Demetrio. Then she packed her bags, put on a medical mask, and headed to the station. Later that night, on the train, she pinned a detailed message to her aunt, my dearest, beloved auntie. I am grateful for everything you've done for me. Forgive me for lying to you. Actually, I'm leaving alone today. 
I can't tell you where so that neither you nor Demetrio would try to find me. I can't bear to see your pity and pain when you look at me. I'll come back to you on my face, if not as it was before the fire, will at least look so that I can calmly look at myself in the mirror. Don't worry about me. I have savings, and I will be working. I will be all right. Don't call me. I will write to you from time to time. I love you and embrace you warmly. Your Tina. Composing a letter to Demetrio was significantly more challenging. She wrote through a veil of tears, My beloved, I'm leaving, and I don't want you to seek me out. I will return when I'm ready to face you again, renewed. It pains me to see how much you suffer when you look upon my disfigured face. You do your best to hide it, but I can't take it any longer. I will never forget the look on the ultrasound technician's face when she informed us about our son. You are so handsome, and I'm so dreadful. That's probably what she was thinking, wondering why you're with me. I've been asking myself the same question ever since I overheard your mother and Aunt Dahlia's conversation. They believed you were with me out of pity and because of your good upbringing. I've come to agree with them. But I need more than just your pity. Registering our marriage was a mistake. If you wish to divorce, you can leave the papers with Aunt Litcha. She, too, does not know my whereabouts. But I plan to return to her after my plastic surgery. I will respect and accept your decision, but for now, I can't bear to see you. Perhaps later, but not now. Forgive me, my beloved. Yours, Tina. After sending the message, she replaced the SIM card in her phone. Thus, her new life began. The Eastern Star Restaurant offered the highest pay per night among all the job offers Tina had considered. She planned to save up for her plastic surgery herself. She had found several clinics specializing in plastic surgery online, sent her medical reports and photos of her face before and after the fire. All responded that her case was complicated. Only one doctor was confident he could restore her natural appearance. Conveniently, his clinic was in the same city she had just moved to. However, the cost was significant. Tina prayed that she would be able to work until the baby's birth. That way, she could save enough for the surgery and the delivery at the same private clinic where she planned to have her surgery. She didn't want to risk her baby's health either. And this clinic could provide support with the baby during her surgery and recovery period. Through a website, Tina found an apartment in the southern city where she planned to work. While traveling by train, she also sourced and ordered the accessories for her stage image to hide her facial deformity. She had brought her performance dress with her. She had chosen a loose silhouette dress. Her pregnancy was not yet visible, and it seemed that Tina's body structure would allow her to conceal her condition for the longest possible time, but it was better to play it safe and avoid anything form-fitting. The morning sickness had receded. Tina quickly adapted to the nocturnal lifestyle. During the day, she made sure to get plenty of sleep, shrouding her windows with dark, opaque curtains. After her nightly performances, she would stroll along the boardwalk, breathing in the salty sea air and basking in the soft morning sun. She never forgot her vitamins and paid close attention to her diet. She still loved to sing, and the Eastern Star proved to be a peaceful establishment, free from fights and loud disputes. Here, belly dancing was the common performance, but Tina kept to herself. She was promptly given a private dressing room, off-limits to anyone else. The owner of the place held her in high regard, cherishing her vocal talents. He often lamented that she would only work until mid-August, as originally stated. The patrons of the restaurant thoroughly enjoyed Tina's performances. Several men attempted to strike up conversations with her, but she immediately asked the owner to deter such advances. He took it upon himself to deal with anyone who infringed on her space. The security staff also ensured that Tina's interests were always protected. She considered herself fortunate in this regard. In June, on her days off, she spent more time secluded in the hidden corners of the wild beach, donning a wide-brimmed hat and covering her face with a thick, white veil. In this city, no one saw her without this essential accessory. Once a week, she would swap in her old SIM card and send Aunt Litcha short messages, assuring her that everything was fine and she would wait for a reply. 
Aunt Litcher wrote that she missed her and eagerly awaited her return, also mentioning that Demetrio often came around, hoping for any news about Tina. Tina knew without Aunt Litcher's words that her husband was worried and anxious. The first time she swapped her SIM card, a deluge of messages from Demetrio and her childhood friend, Diego, poured in. She hadn't informed Diego of her whereabouts all this time. Tina, please tell me where you are. I'm very worried and I want to see you, Demetrio pleaded. Can I help you financially? He asked. Tina had blocked the bank cards she used in her hometown and opened new ones. Mostly, she dealt with cash and she certainly did not count on Demetrio's assistance. She wanted to retort, give the money to your mother, remembering the conversation she had accidentally overheard between her mother-in-law and Aunt Dahlia. But Tina wouldn't allow herself such a childish response. She simply declined, writing, I'm doing fine. I don't need the money. The possibility of additional finances wouldn't hurt, even though Tina had already managed to accumulate nearly half the sum she needed, despite her daily expenses. She'd chosen her workplace wisely after all. She decided to accept money from Demetrio only if she fell short for the childbirth and the surgery, but that was a bridge to cross later. Diego, forgive me for vanishing, she wrote to her childhood friend. Unpleasant things happened in my life, and I had to change my residence. I'll return in the fall. I hope to see you then. Good luck completing your service. She knew Diego's military service would end in July. After responding to the messages, Tina immediately changed her SIM card, fearing someone might call. Particularly, she didn't want Demetrio to call. She had no intention of answering, but seeing his name saved in her contacts and hearing the ringtone set specifically for him were terribly painful for her. Tina saw a doctor at a private clinic not far from home. She was assured that her pregnancy was progressing well. She herself felt wonderful, delighting in the moments when the baby began to stir in her womb. Fortunately, her body's form hadn't changed much. Little one, everything will be splendid for us, Tina would smile, stroking her belly. Diego planned to go straight to Aunt Litch's from the train station to learn about the unpleasant incidents Tina had mentioned. However, those plans had to change. Parents and close relatives poured onto the platform, welcoming their soldier home. The festive table was already set at home, and Diego had to accept it. In the evening, when the guests had left, he told his mother he was going out for a stroll, intending to head to Aunt Litch's nearby. Son, did you hear news about your friend? His mother asked as Diego prepared to leave. Have you been in contact? Very rarely lately. What happened? Diego tensed up. Right before New Year's, there was a fire in the house where Tina lives, on the first floor. A mother had left her three-year-old alone to pop to the shop, and the little one found matches. Tina managed to pull the child out of the window during the fire, but she got injured. There was a picnic gas canister in the kitchen. It exploded. Her face, it was very sad. I didn't see it myself, people told me. She wrote to me in December that she was going to get married, Diego replied sadly, then she stopped writing. I figured a happily married woman doesn't have time to keep up with childhood friends. Where is she now? I heard she left in an unknown direction on her wedding day. Thanks for telling me, Diego kissed his mother on the cheek and stepped outside. Diego bumped into Aunt Litcha at the store and helped her carry her grocery bags home. The woman was glad to see her niece's faithful friend. It's a pity you weren't around, Diego, she said after narrating the aftermath of the fire for Tina. The psychologist did everything she could, and there were improvements, but she needed time before plastic surgery. Why? Diego asked, surprised. Tina is pregnant. The doctor said anesthesia would harm the baby, and physically it was better to wait. But psychologically, Tina was not coping. She was so distressed every time her fiancé came to see her, upset that he saw her in that state. But he didn't refuse to marry her, the young man pointed out. That's right. And now he comes almost every day to see if there's any news from her. Why doesn't he look for her? She doesn't want him to. He respects her decision. 
As they reached the apartment, Aunt Licha invited Diego in for a cup of coffee. He accepted. But no sooner had she put the kettle on the stove than the doorbell rang. That must be Demetrio. Soon, Demetrio entered the kitchen with Aunt Licha. Diego immediately guessed it was him. Not just because of the phrase the woman said upon seeing him at the doorstep. This handsome man with blue eyes could indeed make Tina fall in love with him. Resisting such a character was undoubtedly impossible. Aunt Licha introduced the young men and left the kitchen to get her phone to read them a text from Tina. So you're that childhood friend of my wife? Demetrio sighed sadly. It seems so, since she talked to you about me, Diego agreed. How could you let her go? She, in a way, ran away from our wedding. Did you upset her? Diego asked sternly. No, I didn't hurt her. But she might have overheard a conversation between my mother and her aunt. They weren't ready for how Tina looks now. Demetrio fell silent, searching for words. Ugly? Diego clarified. Unusual, Demetrio found the right word. Aunt Licha told me what happened. What are you planning to do? Wait for her to come back, Demetrio simply answered. Diego declined the offer for coffee, citing pressing matters, and bid farewell to Aunt Licha. He felt a strong aversion to shaking Demetrio's hand and was glad the man hadn't offered it. They exchanged simple nods of parting. Diego couldn't fathom the seething rage he felt towards Tina's husband. The easiest explanation would be jealousy. He was scared to admit to himself that his feelings towards his childhood friend, Tina, were far from platonic. Her message, wherein she wrote about falling in love, had profoundly shaken him. He had regretted not confessing his feelings to her before leaving for his service duty. He chastised himself for that every day since receiving that text message. But would anything have changed had he confessed? Would Tina's love for Demetrio not have come to pass if she knew Diego's true feelings? It was impossible to know now. However, what he knew for certain was that no amount of disfigurement could alter his feelings for Tina. In this, he was resolute. Returning home, he decided to commence the search for his beloved. Regardless of the fact that she was married to another man and expecting his child, she was alone now and needed support, even if she was too stubborn to admit it. It meant that a loyal friend needed to find her and stand by her until she decided what to do next. Diego scrolled through his mobile feed, clicking on amusing viral videos. Amidst numerous cat videos and sultry beauties, his gaze landed on a veiled girl, her forehead obscured by a stylish cap. Diego pressed play. And then he heard a voice that was achingly familiar. And those green eyes. He doubted his recognition until the camera zoomed in on her right hand holding the microphone. On her index finger, he spotted something he had seen countless times before. Diego took a screenshot and zoomed in on the image. There, he could make out a small birthmark in the shape of a heart. There was no doubt about it, it was Tina. The question was, where was she singing? He searched the video title and quickly found the original. Some unknown blogger was celebrating a birthday at a nightclub called Eastern Star located in a coastal city. Without wasting any time, Diego booked a ticket on the next train and promptly packed his travel bag. He told his parents that a colleague had found him a seasonal job on the coast and he had to leave immediately. Son, you could have at least taken a week off. You've just returned from your service, his mother lamented. I'll rest by the sea, Diego replied with a smile. Throughout his journey, he watched the video several times, amazed that Tina was singing in some eastern language. Despite it being unusual, it sounded wonderful, just like any song performed by her. Her veiled face added an aura of mystery, and her eyes radiated an immense amount of energy and warmth. Diego went to the Eastern Star website and clicked on the job section. They were hiring waiters and bartenders, even without experience, with on-the-job training provided. This was perfect. He could work at the same place as Tina. Diego quickly put together a resume and sent it to the email listed on the site. As he was getting off the train, he received a message saying he was expected for an interview in two hours. 
he confirmed his attendance. That very evening, Diego donned the restaurant uniform and commenced his duties as a waiter. They provided him with a room to stay nearby, which he was more than happy about, given it would save him some rent. He had some savings, but he knew those would come in handy for Tina. You'll start off clearing the tables, instructed the manager. Tomorrow, I'll teach you a little before your shift. In truth, there's nothing too complicated. You just need to learn the menu and familiarize yourself with the drinks the bar offers. Sounds good, Diego readily agreed. He got to know his colleagues. Seeing the affable young man, some of the dancers approached him. Introducing himself with a light joke, he quickly won the girls over. At last, a decent guy has come to work with us, one of them commented. Diego didn't quite grasp what she meant. He was eagerly awaiting Tina's arrival. He recognized her by her walk, a light, almost gliding step. That's how she entered the restaurant, freezing in surprise as her childhood friend emerged in a restaurant uniform with a tray in his hands. Diego, what are you doing here? Tina exclaimed joyfully. She abruptly stopped herself, probably remembering her face was hidden behind a veil. Tina. Diego quickly put down the tray and rushed over to embrace her. Just be careful, she whispered. Of course, he murmured, understanding that Tina was alluding to her pregnancy, although there was no visible sign of a baby bump, especially beneath her loose-fitting maxi dress. So much for my incognito, Tina remarked, what a coincidence you're working here. You must have just gotten back from the military, right? Just please, don't let anyone know I'm here too. I'm so happy to see you. I'm happy to see you too, Tina. But what's with the cloak and dagger? Why are you hiding? Diego wanted to hear Tina's side of the story, so he didn't mention that he knew what had happened to her. By the way, this stage persona is really cool. It suits you. You look stunning. He was speaking the truth. Diego wasn't just flattering her. I'll tell you everything, Tina promised before heading towards the stage. In the early morning, after their shifts ended, they strolled slowly through the deserted resort town. And Tina began to share her story about the fire, her marriage, and her pregnancy. Show me your face, he asked after she had finished her story. No. Tina shouted, I don't want you to see my ugliness and run away. Don't even dream of it. I've seen your face when you were sick with chickenpox in the sixth grade, remember? I managed to endure it. No, it's worse now, Tina said, her voice filled with sadness. And she removed her veil and hat. Damn. Diego exclaimed. Honestly, I thought it would be much worse. I remember your pimples in ninth grade. I think it was even more striking back then. You didn't need to wear the veil. I don't see anything scary. Unless it's part of your stage persona, adding to your mystique. Thank you for your support, Diego, she smiled, her face exposed. But apart from you, I won't let anyone else see me like this. I will get plastic surgery soon, and I hope my old appearance will return. I just need to save a little more money and wait for the birth. Would you accept a small amount from me? Diego cautiously inquired. Well, only if it's small, Tina laughed. It's so great that we've met. I missed you so much. I only realized it now. They took each other's hands, just as they did when they were children, and walked along the promenade towards Tina's house. That's what she had been missing all this time, her loyal friend, Diego. He looked at her just as he did when she was beautiful and appealing to all. Tina saw no difference, felt no difference. And it felt so great because everyone, except Diego, who saw her after the fire, could not hide their terror and pity. He looked at her as if she was just as beautiful as the day they parted when he left for his service. Only with Diego could she be silly, laugh loudly, and jest without worrying about the impression she would make because he had known her for almost her entire life. Why isn't your belly growing? Diego asked Tina as they lay on the bed in her room, clad in their clothes, staring at the ceiling. The bed was neatly covered with a blanket. My baby knows we can't reveal our special condition, Tina declared, smiling. 
I have to quit my job in a week at the latest, otherwise I might give birth right on stage. Can I touch your belly? Go for it. Baby, say hello to your uncle, Tina suggested, and she felt a jolt when Diego placed his hand on her belly. He responded. Diego exclaimed with delight. A polite boy. My son, Tina laughed. Unexpectedly, Diego kissed her belly, then the tips of her fingers, and gently touched his lips to Tina's. She looked at her friend in surprise, not understanding what was happening. What are you doing? Kissing you. I've wanted to do this for a long time, Diego simply replied. Why? Because I love you. She abruptly got up from the bed and froze in place with frightened eyes. What happened? Diego quickly rose as well. I think my water just broke, Tina said in a flustered manner. What do we need to do? Call a cab and take me to the clinic where I've arranged to give birth. I'll take care of everything. Tell me the address. Throughout the ride, Diego held Tina's hand while she whimpered softly from the pain. At the clinic, they immediately took her to a room while Diego stayed behind to fill out the paperwork. Were you planning on having a joint birth? A nurse asked Diego. Not really. Do you want to be present? Can I? Yes, I'll give you something to change into now. Diego was given pants, a gown, a cap, a mask, and gloves, and was immediately escorted to the room where Tina had been wheeled in earlier on a chair. Wow, I can barely recognize you. At first, Tina laughed when she saw Diego, but then she yelped and began to whimper again, just like in the car on the way there. I refused pain relief, Tina said when the pain subsided. I don't want to harm the baby in any way. Will you stay with me? Yes, they didn't dress me up like this for nothing. Thank you, Diego. Tina burst into tears. I'm so scared. I never thought it would be this terrifying. I'll be here. I'll be with you, Diego assured her, wrapping his arms around her and kissing her cheek, marked with scars. You have a wonderful husband, the doctor remarked, to which Tina didn't object. Diego stayed with Tina throughout the birth of their child. She clung to his hand, squeezing it tightly during her contractions. He whispered the kindest and most soothing words to her. And then, he was the first person, after Tina, to hold their newborn son. Happy Dad, here's your son, a nurse said, handing Diego the baby. Tina, he's beautiful. Diego exclaimed, a joyous smile spreading across his face. And you did well, he told the infant. Happy birthday. The Magnolia restaurant was festively adorned for a wedding banquet. Behind the table meant for the bride and groom, a designer and her assistants were finishing the decoration of a wall. They were attaching the names Demetrio and Maria to a swath of fabric, draped from the top and adorned with fresh flowers. Claudia Prieto, wearing a new, glamorous dress chosen with her future daughter-in-law at a fashionable boutique, strode proudly among the decorated tables. Everything was just as she wanted. All relatives would be at Demetrio's wedding. They would appreciate the grand scale of it all. Claudia Prieto retreated to the powder room to touch up her makeup. As she looked at herself in the mirror, her thoughts drifted back. Just a bit over a year ago, she had been here for her son's wedding. She wished she could forget, but memories often insist on reminding one of painful and unpleasant events. Claudia grimaced, recalling the ugly face of her former daughter-in-law, whom she had seen for the first time then. Imagine running away right from the wedding. If only she had done it before becoming Demetrio's wife. Then, there wouldn't have been a need for a divorce. Fortunately, they managed to resolve that problem quickly. Claudia finally convinced her son to file for divorce. And he did, finally divorcing and finding an ideal match for himself. As for the child born to that ugly woman, Claudia couldn't bear to call him her grandson. Demetrio announced that he intended to support the child financially. How honorable he was, perhaps excessively so. This deeply irked Claudia, but she let him handle it. What mattered was that the unsightly daughter-in-law was history, and her son had soon met his true love, the beautiful Maria. This time, he had made a choice that delighted his mother's heart. 
The wedding festivities were in full swing when Claudia Prieto, having stepped away into the kitchen, heard what seemed to be a familiar, incredibly beautiful melody. Then, a magical female voice began to sing Ave Maria. Pure high notes flowed freely and effortlessly. Claudia was mesmerized, as if hearing an angel descended from the heavens. Such a divine voice, ebbing and flowing in harmony with some unknown force. The woman walked back into the hall and looked towards the stage where a slender, delicate girl was standing by the microphone. She indeed looked like an angel. Her long, blonde hair cascaded onto her shoulders, framing a stunningly beautiful face. Claudia Prieto realized it was her former daughter-in-law. The entire restaurant fell silent while she sang, only to erupt into loud applause when the song ended. Demetrio and Maria, congratulations. Tina said with a slight bow before descending the stage to approach a tall, broad-shouldered young man holding a small child in his arms. Demetrio immediately approached them, leaving his bride at the table. Tina? He couldn't hide his surprise. Thank you for the gift. Your singing, as always, is beyond praise. I'm so glad that things have worked out for you. You look wonderful. Thank you, Demetrio, so do you. Let me introduce you, this is my husband, Diego. We've already met, Demetrio said, somewhat disconcerted, averting his gaze. The situation was becoming rather awkward for him. And this is Maureen, Tina introduced the little boy. You know who he is, right? Yes, of course, the groom responded, visibly confused, and then added hastily, Will you be staying? I'll ask to have a table arranged for you. No, Demetrio, thank you, Tina smiled. It's time for us to leave. We just stopped by to congratulate you. We learned about your wedding from some mutual friends. With that, they left the restaurant. The groom sighed, watching them leave, before returning to his bride and slightly bewildered mother. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.